The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between two students. The students are talking about a house they might rent. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hi, Jason. So what's the house like? I hope it's as good as the advert made out. It's OK. I think I finally found something we'll both like at last. Brilliant. So what's it like? Well, it's within walking distance of uni. It's in a residential area. There aren't many students living there, but it's easy to get onto campus. And the city centre is only a bus ride away. OK, that's a good start. But what's it like inside? To be honest, when I saw the advert, I didn't think it would be big enough for the three of us. The rent's not exactly cheap for the area. So come on, is it worth it? Well, it's got three bedrooms and a nice living room, so we'll all have our own space to work and somewhere to sit together. It's clean and there's no need to decorate. I'm sure your mum and dad would be happy with it, if that's anything to go by. OK, that sounds promising. And the landlady was really nice. She's not one of those people with a lot of properties. In fact, this is the only one she has, so she really looks after it. Her daughter was a student and stayed there last year, apparently. Good. The advert said there's no garage, but I can park on the road outside. I checked, and there are no parking restrictions along that road. I know there are some shops in the neighbourhood, so we'll be OK for food and basic things. Yes, that's right. It's a nice house, and the kitchen's fine. I suppose it's not exactly modern, but it's clean and functional. All the things you need, washing machine, cooker... There's no garden, which is a shame, so nowhere to sit in the summer. But there's Wi-Fi, so all in all, I'm happy with it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Right then, I think we've cracked it. I'd like to see it myself before we sign anything. I might pop along later to have a look. It's on Foxwell Road, isn't it? Let me just make a note of the address. That's F-O-X-W-E-L-L -L Road. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Number 94. I'll come along with you for another look. So you know what the rent is, don't you? £430 a month. I know that's £50 a month more than we were expecting to pay, but I think it's worth it. Hmm, it sounds reasonable, especially if it's in a nice area. And we need to pay a deposit as well, don't we? According to the ad, that's one month rent in advance. Yes, that's right. That's normal when you rent, so I was expecting it. You'd better give the landlady a ring if we want to have a look round. Why not give her a call and see if she's free later? OK, good idea. What's her number? It's a mobile number, 01764 445 328. Right, I'll phone her now. Hopefully she'll be free and we can go over there this evening. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 2. Part 2 You will hear a man talking about areas for growing vegetables in towns called allotments. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many of you. I was going to start by saying that more and more people are seeing the value of growing their own fruit and vegetables, but now I don't need to. First of all, let me say that whether you have a garden or not, there are all sorts of benefits to having a plot of land you can call your own, and it will give you a great sense of satisfaction. OK, let's assume you have a garden. Chances are it's small. Most gardens in cities are hardly big enough for a few pots of herbs and a couple of rows of beans. Now that's where allotments come in. A typical plot is around 250 square metres, big enough to feed the family for a year, big enough, too, to grow a whole range of vegetables, fruit as well, perhaps, not just cabbages and potatoes. Moving on to the social aspects of an allotment. How many people can say their garden is a meeting place? You might chat with your next-door neighbour every now and again, but allotments are notorious communal hives. There are usually between 10 and 30 plots on any allotment site, and they bring together people from all sorts of social backgrounds. Where else do you find a lawyer deep in conversation with a lorry driver? There's often a great sense of camaraderie, with initiatives to involve the wider community, including the less able, the retired, and the unemployed. In urban areas nowadays, people may have a tiny yard or a balcony, but it's not a garden. An allotment is a huge recreational asset for anyone in that situation. First of all, there's the exercise. Renting an allotment costs around £30 a month. That's generally a lot cheaper than joining a gym. Then there's the involvement with nature. Watching seeds grow into mature plants gives so much pleasure and such a sense of achievement. Spending time outside in the fresh air boosts our mental as well as physical well-being. And one more thing. Don't forget allotments are also an enormous benefit to the environment. They provide invaluable green space in our ever more clogged up towns and cities, making them more sustainable and appealing to live in. These spaces provide a habitat for wild plants, birds, insects and occasionally bigger animals. What's more, Locally grown food doesn't have to be transported long distances, and that helps to reduce road traffic and hence pollution. Now, food. A subject we all like talking about, because the main appeal of an allotment is obviously taking home all the freshly picked vegetables and fruit. So why is Grow Your Own so good? Well, to start with, there's the superior flavour. Food you've grown yourself tastes infinitely better than anything bought in the supermarket because it will be super fresh. Another point in its favour is the range. These days, gardeners are growing an amazing variety of vegetables on their allotments. Finally, 
there's the bonus of knowing that the produce you've grown is organic. You know that what you're eating wasn't grown on an industrial scale farm or sprayed with large amounts of pesticides. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. Now I'm going to show you a typical allotment from the site closest to here on Finlay Road. Let me just get this image up. That's it. Can everyone see? So, as you can see here, each plot has a fence around it and its own gate. Between the beds are grass walkways. That means you can walk in and around comfortably and not get your boots too muddy. There are soil beds on either side. This plot, in fact, has two smaller flower beds opposite a much larger area for vegetables. And there's also a glass house for growing tomatoes or anything that needs more warmth and protection. Here you can see one of those at the front near the gate. Most allotments have their own shed at the far end, as you can see. Allotments do need a water source, though, and there are stone sinks outside the sheds. A hose pipe can be attached to the tap for easy watering. Some of the plots have a pond, though they're not always popular, as they tend to attract insects. And this plot has a compost bin at the end opposite the shed for recycling organic waste. Right. So, how to go about getting an allotment? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about tea between an expert and a reporter. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 24. Hi, Jacob. Thank you so much for coming along today. It's my pleasure. I'm very intrigued about what a tea meditation entails exactly. Well, it's very simple, really. I think the first thing you need to keep in mind is that it is mostly about leaving everything that you have been thinking or worrying about today to one side. Really focus on the present moment. Oh, it sounds great. I certainly don't know very much about tea and I'm keen to get started. But before you go into more detail, can I ask you what your favourite kind of tea is? Well, I think the kind of tea we are going to have today is my favourite. It is Pu'er tea from Yunnan province in southern China. What makes this tea special? Pu'er is a dark tea. The regions of Yunnan, the north of Vietnam and Laos, have one of the best climates for growing tea in the world. Pu'er is a post-fermented tea. Oh, what is a post-fermented tea exactly? It is a tea that has undergone a period of ageing in the open air. They age the tea for days, even years. The exposure to humidity and oxygen help to oxidise the tea leaves and encourage fermentation. 
This changes the smell of the tea and also removes a lot of bitterness from the taste. It sounds similar to the process of aging wine. The process is different, but the effect of aging on the taste is certainly similar. Does this mean the tea can be quite expensive? Absolutely, it can be very expensive. The tea is usually pressed into balls or cakes and sold. At one time, only tea enthusiasts cared about buying these cakes, but now many people have realised that they are an investment, and so buy them like they would buy gold because the price goes up a lot over time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. So now I want you to focus on clearing your mind of anything other than this present moment. Let go of any concerns. Okay,、uh, one slight problem. I will need to record our conversation, and I will need to take notes for the article.、Uh, I plan to write about this for my newspaper.、Uh, is that okay? Oh yes, of course. Whatever you need. Thank you. I'll try to keep my notes to a minimum. Good. So where was I? Oh yes, I think very few people really appreciate the complexity and variety of tea that exists in the world. Right. Most people are maybe like me and just use tea bags. Exactly. And with a tea bag, the tea is trapped inside and cannot move around freely. You can really taste the difference drinking a brewed tea that was free to move around through all the water. So, do you ever use tea bags? Never. There are many different kinds of tea: white, yellow, black, green, oolong, matcha, herbal, and many others. Each one has its own unique properties. To fully experience what each tea has to offer, you must brew it in the correct way. I also believe in only drinking tea that is picked and sorted by hand, rather than using mechanical processes. Although it takes more time, the tea made by hand is so much better that it leads to an increase in the tea sales. But in that case, surely if there is more interest in the tea, and with the time-intensive farming process, this means there could be shortages because the demand is higher than the ability to produce it. There were shortages for a while, but then an artificial fermentation process was developed in the 1970s, which helped to speed up the fermentation times. As I mentioned, this process has an aging effect on the taste of pu'er tea that is very similar to the effect on the taste of wine that you get from that fermentation process. Though for pu'er tea today, we are talking about that artificial process. How can they do this artificially? The farmers gather the tea leaves into a big pile, then cover it with a large sheet or tarp. They spray water on the tea every now and then, and therefore fermentation happens faster. Usually, the tea is left for thirty, forty-five, sixty, or even ninety days. Still, the farmer will check the tea every few days, and just by the feel of the tea, he knows whether it is ready or if it needs more time. Wow. That sounds like a fascinating process. I never realised that there was such a science behind producing tea. Well, now you are ready for the best part—the tasting of it. That sounds like a very good idea to me. So what I will do now is boil the water, and we can begin our meditation. What does that entail? We need to focus on only two things. The first is your mind and body. Forget everything that you have been worrying about today. Forget about what you have to do later on, or what somebody said to you earlier. Focus on your breathing and on how your body feels. If you have aches and pains, acknowledge them. Pinpoint where there is tension in your body and try to release it. Oh yes, I can really feel tension in my shoulders. 
Let it go. Close your eyes if that helps. Take deep breaths in, and out. Soon we will drink the tea. When you drink it, think about the taste and how it feels on your tongue. Is it easy to swallow the tea, or do you need to gulp it? Can you brew the tea leaves more than once? Oh yes, you can brew some teas more than ten times. Now we will shift to noble silence, focusing only on ourselves and the tea. Enjoy. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk about whale migration. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Today we're going to continue our investigation into the use of technology in plotting oceanographic migratory patterns, and I'd like to focus specifically on creatures that we didn't even realize existed until very recently: pygmy blue whales, in particular. I'd like to talk about a high-tech method of tracking that researchers have used to find out more about these creatures. Pygmy blue whales, which are one of several subspecies of blue whales, spend their lives in the vast expanses of the Indian and Southern Pacific oceans. They were first identified as a distinct subspecies in 1966. Before then, they were probably confused with the Antarctic or True blue whale, so it's only recently that researchers have started to learn about them and their migrations to and from their breeding and feeding grounds. Scientists are interested in pygmy blue whales because, although they are a very mobile subspecies, very little is known about their movements and their populations. Large-scale movements of whales are particularly hard to study. And what we do know about pygmy blue whales, we've mainly learned from examining whaling records. There are several populations of pygmy blue whales in the southern hemisphere, and two main feeding grounds off southern and western Australia. Scientists were interested in testing their hypothesis that the pygmy blue whales feeding off western Australia migrate to Indonesia to breed. To track the whales' movements, researchers made use of something called satellite telemetry. This refers to the use of a satellite-linked tag attached to a whale. When the antenna on the whale breaks the surface of the water, the tag communicates with the satellite system. The location of the whale can be determined when multiple satellites receive the tag's transmissions, much like how the navigation system works on a mobile phone. Researchers receive this location data in almost real time via the project website, 
which allows them to track the movement of the tagged whale from many miles away. The use of these tags has enabled researchers to discover that pygmy blue whales do indeed travel northwards from the west coast of Australia in March and April, reaching the warmer breeding grounds of Indonesia in June. They remain there until September, at which time they then return to Australian waters. In addition to identifying the migratory pattern of this particular population of pygmy whales, researchers also shone new light on the whale's feeding patterns. It's usually assumed that whales go without food outside of the summer when they leave their feeding grounds. But interestingly, the pygmy blue whales studied travel from productive feeding grounds off Western Australia to productive areas in Indonesia, and therefore probably still have the opportunity to feed whilst they're in their breeding grounds. It is hoped that mapping the migratory movements of the pygmy whales will help conservation efforts for these endangered animals. And the study has enabled researchers to identify specific conservation issues. For example, the migratory routes of pygmy blue whales correspond closely with shipping routes. Consequently, researchers are keen to monitor whether this has any negative effects on the whale's behaviour. Baleen whales, these are whales that use filters to feed, not teeth, use sounds to communicate and to gain information about their environment. Clearly, as pygmy blue whale movements correspond to shipping routes, there is potential for the noise generated by ships to affect communication and hence social encounters and feeding. Previously, researchers could only hypothesise that pygmy blue whales occupying Western Australian waters travelled into Indonesian waters, now that this hypothesis has been borne out by evidence, conservation efforts can be undertaken in a wider area than just Australian waters. However, scientists aren't stopping here. A question mark still remains over the movements of the pygmy blue whales that utilise the feeding grounds further south, off the southern coast of Australia. Genetic evidence indicates that there is a mixing taking place between the population of whales in the feeding grounds of Western Australia and the population further south. Researchers are keen to discover whether the pygmy whales from the southern feeding grounds follow a similar migration route to those from the west coast, or whether they migrate to the subtropical region to the south of Australia. As a result, there are plans to tag the pygmy blue whales further south in order to find out whether they move through the same areas as the Western population and are therefore exposed to the same risks. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.